Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Life and Happiness Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Good morning, Vietnam! Or do you prefer, good morning, Baltimore? <laughs> this is Jeffrey Nolte, the Life and Happiness Podcast here on the GSMC Podcast Network. Welcome aboard this morning. Uh, to each of those credits, good morning, Vietnam. Robin Williams, he was the best person for that role. And John Waters of Baltimore wrote um, Hairspray. Love both of them. We start out with our life and happiness quotes for the day. Quote, the great thing about getting older is that you don't lose all the other ages you've been. Madeline L'Engle, an American writer. Her books reflect her Christian faith and her strong interest in modern science. Second one, quote, what a testing of character adversity is, unquote. Harry Emerson Fosdick, an American pastor, one of the most prominent liberal ministers in early 20th century. Quote, Every man who rises above the common level has received two educations, the first from his teachers, the second, more personal and more important, from himself. Edward Gibbon, an English historian. And Russ Edgar wasn't able to find who that is online except a gentleman who died in 2020, from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Perhaps it was he who said, quote, you don't have to know everything to be happy. In fact, it helps. So remember those quotes as I kind of proceed through the show today. Segment one, I call it, the proof is in the proofs. Or was it? Yesterday I was kind of bound up with trying to come up with ideas. And this is, doing the podcast has been a fascinating exercise for me. I've realized that it's difficult sometimes to come up with topics. Uh, I don't want to just get on and just talk and talk and talk. I want there to be some good facts and information, of course. I want it to make sense. I do want to think outside the box a little bit. I've always done that. I talked about that in the first show. That's important to me. So the proof is in the proofs, or was it? So I was thinking about my life and happiness, or the converse, unhappiness. And can I resolve some of the unhappiness I experienced as a younger kid? And I know I can as a 59-year-old man. Time heals, first of all. And if I think I can rectify and resolve something, then I am on my way to doing it. When I took geometry in 10th grade, I didn't do well at proofs. They absolutely flabbergasted me. I was baffled. I was fearful because of my degree of baffledness. I didn't get it. I didn't get them. Looking back on it, it's okay. It's really okay that I didn't. But I felt very alone, which is what we do as humans, right? We think we're the only one who doesn't understand something. The only one who doesn't get it. Well, I'm sure I was not alone. But we get good at hiding those things. We get good at masking the fact that we're clueless about something. So that's what I did. I dreaded geometry when we got to proofs. I'd sit with probably my head down looking like I was doing something, so I was less apt to be called on. But teachers aren't stupid. They know exactly that kind of behavior. So there were times when I was probably called on, and I I just didn't want to seem stupid. But I felt incredibly stupid because proofs didn't make sense to me. Because there was a logical to it. There was an analysis to it. There was an order 
to it. And I just didn't see that. I didn't get it. And I think we kind of rushed through it probably. I think these things take time from what I've been reading in preparation for this piece. It takes time like it did. I mean, you create a muscle memory even in mathematics, going through steps repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And to prove something, there are cogent and logical steps to do that. Just as when I trained to do a double flip in skating, I did all the proper technique, technique of the entrance, the jump, and the landing. And I did that over and over and over to build the muscle memory to get to have a successful and nice double flip. Well, the same applies to mathematics, as I learned. But I just really remember being debilitated by that. And it wasn't just proofs. There were other things in math. But I took to algebra. I took to algebra 2 and trigonometry. And this also calls up the two sides of the brain, doesn't it? We have a left and a right side. The left is known to be more based in logic and analysis, some of the things that I think I'm not good at. And the right supposedly deals with our emotions and our creative sides and expression and all that kind of stuff, the things that I at which I'm good. There's that internal struggle, well, I must be just right side, right-sided because my left must be asleep most of the time or something. But you know what? I am more logical and analytical than I think I am, than I give my, myself credit to be. I am. I think logically and analytically through other aspects of my life. But in, in school at that age, and we're tested, you know, achievement tests and all that, I, I was sometimes average in some of the stuff like math, and I would do well in the verbal, but it played a part in my, in my life. There's no doubt about it. I did some research on this, and I came across this article on people.math.se.edu, an article by Joshua N. Cooper. It's entitled, wonderfully enough, Why Do We Have to Learn Proofs? Quote, A proof is an argument, a justification, a reason that something is true. It's got to be a particular kind of reasoning, logical, to be called a proof. There again, we call on the logical side of the brain, the left. He goes on to say that proofs in 10th grade geometry are basic at best and are, quote, not one of those horrible, his word, not mine, two-column tables of axioms and deductions you saw in 10th grade geometry. Yeah, I sure did. Dread it every minute. He says that was a, quote, bizarre invention of mathematics educators which constitutes a particular way to write down a very special kind of proof in a very narrow area. Whew. Good to know that now in 2021. <laughs> After all that pain back in 10th grade, he goes on to say, quote, A proof is just the answer to the question, Why? when the person asking the question wants an argument that is indisputable, in the sense that any person of normal intelligence who has enough time could be convinced of it, end quote. It's an answer to the question, why? Why is the sky blue? Why is, you know, all those things we ask why when we're little people and continue to hopefully through life. He goes on to say that we use proofs all the time. Two examples he mentions. Why is it cheaper to buy the larger can of beans? We are proving something about the respective prices when we do that. Another thing. When we know we cannot turn right on red at a certain intersection, we've constructed a proof of the illegality of this move. The reasoning process goes as follows. Normally, I have to stop at a red light. But I'm in the right lane, so that rule is superseded by the state law that right on red is okay. However, there is a sign stating it's not okay at this intersection. So it wouldn't be legal to turn. Why didn't I have this guy in geometry? I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. I get the reasoning there. The proof. (laughs) Here's the kicker, though. But why write proofs down if we can just prove them in our minds deductively or inductively? Because unless we write them down, 
The teacher can't tell if you know why something is true. We haven't learned anything if we got an answer by luck or good peripheral vision. That's what he writes. Good peripheral vision. That was me. I'm not typically a cheater, but darned if I didn't try in geometry to see what somebody was writing down when they were solving their proof. Yep, I don't profess to be a cheater, but it, my fear got me to that point, which I know a lot more about fear now. But I didn't know what it was then. But yeah, good peripheral vision. I had to laugh. <laughs> so I'm not the only one. He goes on to say that we can do them. We do them all the time. He reiterates. He says he's literally never met a student who couldn't prove things. He has met many lacking the time to learn how to. Practice, perhaps, when it comes to reasoning about such abstract objects that come up in a math class, but that's just a matter of doing your problem sets. Many proofs, techniques that can guide the way and make things more formulaic once you get the hang of it. Once you get the hang of it. That means maybe you don't have the hang of it to begin with. That it doesn't make sense. But you do it over and over and over. You do your problem sets. Getting the hang of it means practice. I can so relate to that from my sport, as I said earlier. I practice things over and over and over. My sister and I practice things over and over and over to get that muscle memory, to get that familiarity, to get that ownership. So why wouldn't doing proofs be the same thing? Let me tell you something. Thank you, Joshua Cooper. You certainly know who you are for making more sense of what I thought selfishly and self-preservingly to be senseless. And my advice is keep at it to all you baffled geometry students, proofs, quote, confirm how and why geometry helps explain our world and how it works. I feel better already. I think I'm going to ask my one of my clients who went to MIT and is now a mathematics professor at a local university to go to really help me with some proofs. I think I really want to sit down and, and master this and to put that ghost and that little demon to bed. Not even to bed, to kick him out of the room. I don't need to be afraid of proofs anymore. I don't need to keep saying, oh, I was terrible with proofs. Last bit, which is really something I came upon. The Six Mistakes of Man, written by Cicero, a Roman statesman and philosopher, some 2,000 years ago. My, how it applies. Listen to this. The Six Mistakes of Man The delusion that personal gain is made by crushing others, the tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected, insisting that a thing is impossible because we cannot accomplish it, refusing to set aside trivial preferences, Neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and studying. And finally, attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. Wow. Wow. That concludes segment one. When we come back, I'm going to talk about springtime, specifically the birds of spring. How do they make those wonderful sounds? And what are the birds that you remember that had an impact in your life? There are certain occasions when a bird or birds or a type of bird had an impact on me. I want to share some of those. And in segment three, I'm going to talk about the sensitive subject of male pattern baldness. Why does it happen? How do you feel about it when it starts to appear? Or disappear? What are some of the things we can do to slow the process? Segment four will be partly You Know Who You Are and Jeff's Daily Happy List. Please stay with me here on the Life and Happiness podcast, sponsored by the GSMC Podcast Network. As always, it's a pleasure being with you. Be right back. 
Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the Life and Happiness Podcast. My name is Jeffrey Nolt. The podcast is sponsored by the GSMC Podcast Network. So segment one, I did a bit about my love or maybe hate relationship with proofs back in geometry in 10th grade. That's what that was about. Uh, And then I did lay in that The Six Mistakes of Man by Cicero, who is a Roman statesman and philosopher, He wrote that some 2,000 years ago, and I want to get into that more in segment four. Segment three is going to be about, uh, remember my quote, the great thing about getting older is that you don't lose all the other ages you've been. Well, you may not lose the other ages, but you start to lose things like hair. And that first time I saw my bald spot developing, that was really fun. So I'm going to talk about male pattern baldness. Segment two here. Remember that my quote, you don't have to know everything to be happy. In fact, it helps. I didn't know much about birds, really. And it's springtime, and I've been listening to a lot of birds. Birds chirp in the winter, and you see them, but I think I personally am more aware of them in spring, aren't you? Have you noticed birds singing? Have you just noticed more birds out and about and busying themselves? Because the climate, at least in Baltimore, is now forgiving. And the days are longer now, which helps. So I'm going to get into some aspects of birds that I didn't know. Like how they make the sounds that they make. I first want to go back and just talk about the birds. The ones I remember most in my life so far. And I don't think any other bird was kind of more profound growing up than the seagull. The seagull signified that we were on the way to the beach, we were near the ocean, or we had arrived at the ocean, because seagulls are seabirds. Now, we have some, many around Baltimore, because there's a lot of water in the Chesapeake Bay around Baltimore, but it was always, as a kid coming from Pennsylvania, traveling to the beach with my family and maybe extended family members and friends. We were fortunate enough to have a beach home in Nags Head, South Nags Head, And we would go down there for a week or two most summers. My mom just was an avid beach person. She just, the sound of the ocean and the ocean just did something for that, for that lady. It was very unique and special to her. So her time at the beach was sacrosanct. I mean, it was really important to her. And she loved having family and friends there with her. Uh, I know we always arrived at the beach and mom would head off to the store and we're like, the store, that's the last place we want to go. But she also loved cooking and providing for others. That's just who she was. But the, the beach and the ocean gave her great pause and great renewal. So the birds are the ones I remember most, the seagulls. It was just the sound and the way that they would just appear and you knew that you were at the beach. Second, we had bird feeders outside our picture window in on Seagrass Road in Mount Joy in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. My parents were very aware of feeding the birds during the winter because they just don't get as much to eat. So we had the bird feeders out, and there were just a plethora of birds. There were so many different kinds. We had the bird book in the living room right near the window so we could really identify the birds that would come to the bird feeder. We had cardinals and robins and blue jays and chickadees and wrens and crows and grackles and starlings and flickers and warblers, lions, tigers and bears. Oh my, we had morning doves. We had four acres there. 
and we lived out in the country. And the morning doves were so distinct, their sound and the whistle of their wings as they flew. Uh, I'll just never forget things like that. And then the coo the cooing that they sort of do. I don't think morning doves coo, but you get the idea. All the sounds, the cardinals, the robins, and the blue jays, they'd get irritated and they'd they'd make quite a fuss up in the trees. And the little chickadees, chickadee dee 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 the wrens and the crows are of course are very distinct. Grackles would kind of, you know, they had kind of a gravelly sound. Starlings were just kind of always an irritating bird. And flickers would peck the house sometimes. Sunshine. Sunshine was our bright yellow parakeet. And my mom loved sunshine. And she'd always talk to sunshine. And I don't think sunshine ever learned any words. We tried. But sunshine, I just remember all the beautiful sounds that that little parakeet would make. Uh, in the mornings, and sometimes we'd have to cover the cage because she'd be overly chatty. Uh, but she was in the kitchen, so she was far away from bedrooms and things. But just the beautiful sounds that she would make. I remember looking at her like, how do you do that? How do those sounds come out of that sort of strange-looking beak of yours? Uh, but that was sunshine. We lived down the street from the Herbs, and Mr. Herb, John Herb, had this sort of collection of geese and scovies and ducks and things. And I just remember the sounds of the geese and the scovies. And and sometimes the geese would get irritated when you got too close to their little ones or whatever, and they'd come squawking at you. But just, again, the sounds, and they wouldn't sing per se at all. Just their sounds. I'll just never forget it. I lived on Fade Avenue in Baltimore, a couple blocks from where I now live with John. There was a morning dove, bless its little heart, that would come and sit on the ledge right outside the bathroom. It would repeatedly, year after year, try to make this nest, and the window, whatever, would kick up, and the nest would fall down to the uh, bricks below. And I just remember thinking, bless your heart, you just can't get this done, can you? It's just not working out for you. But a peaceful little bird, I'll never forget that little morning dove. When I walk the dog sometimes in Patterson Park here, I'll hear the red-winged blackbirds around the uh, the pond area, the marshy area, and they were really prevalent around the creek that surrounded our home on Seagrass Road in Pennsylvania. So red-winged blackbirds, are, the sound of their singing is very distinct. And then, of course, we were always a fan of Johnny Carson, the great talk show host. Johnny Carson occasionally would have this, I think Joan Embry from the San Diego Zoo, I'm not sure that's who had this parrot, But this parrot would come on, and this parrot would sing, I left my heart in San Francisco. And Johnny Carson would just crack up because it was just, I left my heart in San Francisco. And it would go really low, and he would just lose it in his chair. And I'll just never forget that wonderful parrot singing, I left my heart in San Francisco. So what are your memories of birds and their songs and voices? Why don't you just sit for a moment, and maybe when I was describing mine, you had some thoughts come into your head, but sit and let your mind wander and remember some of the sounds of birds that were notable or that have been notable in your life. I bet you'll remember some. Like I said, it's springtime and the the robins are out. I was walking the dogs the other day, and I just stopped the dogs, and I listened to this robin sing in this tree. And it had different sounds. It wasn't just the same. Old. Several, Some birds have very different sounds that they can create. But the sound from this robin was just beautiful. And I thought, thank goodness spring is here. It's been quite a year for all of us, hasn't it? So more specifically, how do birds produce sound? I ran across this Michael Stein in, a, in the Bird Note podcast. And he gave me some really great information. And I have thoroughly enjoyed doing these podcasts because I'm learning things every time I do these, researching things. But nearly all birds produce sound through an organ unique to birds, the syrinx. The syrinx is not much larger than a raindrop. It's extremely efficient. It uses all the air that passes through it, unlike our larynx, which only allows 2% of the, of the air to go through it. So this syrinx is very effective. There's also an adjacent air sac that helps build pressure on the syrinx, which helps the birds create the sound. It's a set of muscles and membranes located where the branches of the bronchial tubes connect in the chest cavity at the top of the lungs, which then goes up and is the trachea or the windpipe. So our larynx sits at the top of the windpipe and the syrinx sits at the base of that windpipe. A song sparrow, for example, has five to seven muscles that govern the syrinx. 
So they can make all kinds of trills and sounds, and it's just, it's beautiful. Call up the Song Sparrow on YouTube and just listen. It's just remarkable. It really is. Let's say, let's take three types of birds. The corant. It has one muscle, so it has very limited sound. The cardinal produces sound in both the left and right bronchial tubes simultaneously. And then, as I said, the song sparrow has five to seven muscles that govern the syrinx. So they have quite a variety of sound. Beautiful sounds. The syrinx is Greek for pan pipes. Now, pan was the Greek god of the wild, shepherds and flocks, nature of mountain wilds, rustic music and impromptus, and was a companion of the nymphs. Pan was associated with sexuality as well. Mammals have vocal folds. Birds do not. So it is their vocal organ, the syrinx. And as I said, the sound is produced by vibrations of some or all of the muscles and membranes when the air flows through the syrinx. Got more from www.britannica.com. The New World Vulture, for example, can only hiss and grunt, where the songbird has great complexity due to the number of the greater number of muscles around the syrinx. Now, the other night, too, I was walking home, the, walking the dogs down the sidewalk, and I looked up, and I noticed, I stopped, I think they had to pee at a tree, and I looked up, and I saw these little birds perched in the tree, all fluffed up. And I thought, now, why are you not falling out of the tree? Because people fall out of a bunk bed. So how are you staying up there so pristinely and precisely? Why don't we see this little collection of birds on the sidewalk in the mornings? Passerines. Um, Birds, a lot of passerines. The feet of passerines, which are sparrows, wrens, warblers, and, and thrushes, just to name a few, can do almost anything, the feet, from walking to hopping to holding on to nearly any object. They are beautifully adapted for grasping the twigs and similar objects on which they perch. More specifically, there are two thin tendons called flexor tendons that extend from the leg muscles down the back of the tarsus bone and attach to the toes. When a bird lands on a perch, these tendons tighten, and so the toes lock around the perch. This involuntary reflex keeps a sleeping bird from falling off a perch. There's your answer. The tendons stay tight until the legs straighten. As the bird stands up, it jumps up, its legs straighten, the tendons relax, and the toes unlock to release the feet. That's how they do it. Falling asleep up in the perch doesn't change the grip as the weight of the bird keeps the leg in the locked position. So that's life on a perch as a bird. Also, a side note, birds most likely probably don't need much sleep at all, but they're forced to do so in some habitats by the inconvenience of darkness <laughs> that limits their ability to carry out other behaviors for part of each 24-hour period. Also, they kind of get in a half-brain type of sleep, a uni-hemispheric slow-wave sleep. They're still aware of threats out there, but they get into this kind of half-sleep. So uh, I hope you found it interesting, and I hope you can all kind of appreciate the sounds of birds and and what birds have signified different things in your in your lives. But just sit and listen. They're really remarkable. Call up that song, Sparrow. It's a beautiful thing. I want to turn again to the thing I read at the end of the first segment. I think it's that important. Cicero was a Roman statesman and philosopher, and he wrote this some 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. The Six Mistakes of Man. The delusion that personal gain is made by crushing others. The tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected. Insisting that anything is impossible because we cannot accomplish it. Refusing to set aside trivial preferences. Neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and studying. And finally, attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the Life and Happiness Podcast here in the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm Jeff Nolt. So in segment one, I did a piece on proofs, those nasty little feared phenomena back in 10th grade geometry. Segment two, I did a sort of an appreciation of birds. It's springtime and the sounds of birds are everywhere. And I didn't really know how those sounds were produced and created. So now I do, and now you do a little bit better if you listen to segment two. Here we are at segment three. This is a subject that many men can relate to and many women can relate to. It's a sensitive subject, and I was in my late 40s, probably early 50s, when it became apparent to me. The first time I was watching a video of me skating, I'm a figure skater, and when I was being taped from behind, I noticed it. Yes, it. It is something that a multi-billion dollar business out there is trying to help us cope with it. What is it? The beginnings of a bald spot. I first noticed that little silver dollar looking <clears throat> shape on the top of my head. From the front, I didn't really notice any receding yet. But it was that little silver dollar at the top of my head that I noticed. I was horrified. I just didn't think that I was going to lose my hair or be even begin to lose my hair. My hair was important to me. I think hair is a statement about us. At least we make it one. And it was something that I just didn't really consider and that I didn't appreciate. I didn't and don't want a bald spot. I have very nice hair. It does help define me. So, oh no, we're not going there. But we are going there. <laughs> Are any of you men out there and women experiencing it? And do you feel the same way, at least initially? Did it, Does it affect you emotionally? How do you feel about it? It's just something I didn't consider. I didn't really consider aging, though, as a young person. I just didn't. I'm going to talk a little bit about my hair through my life. So when I was a little kid, my dad cut our hair. He didn't put a bowl over our heads like Amish do, or at least that's what they say. But he had clippers, and he would take to our hair every once in a while. And he did a fine job. We were kids. It wasn't a big deal. I just remember thinking, oh, I hope I look decent after this haircut. And usually, I think I did. In high school, it was the thing to do to go to the salon and get your hair washed and then cut and dried. Then it was always parted down the middle and feathered back. Not quite like Farrah Fawcett, but... <laughs> More like David Cassidy, parted down the middle and feathered back. Very important look back then with the painter's pants that we wore in high school. So go figure. Times they do a change. And then I went through my long hair with ponytail phase. I wanted to have long hair. I thought it was a great look on a guy. But my hair is naturally wavy, and I really wanted a ponytail if my hair was very straight. I think it's a very masculine look. I think it looks great on women when their hair is very straight and it's pulled back into a very elegant ponytail. But that was not to be. I had nice I have nice hair, but it was naturally wavy and it would get wispy and it would come out of the ponytail and that sort of thing. So it just wasn't ever the look that I really wanted. Then I went to and part of it was maybe the bald spot coming. I went to tighter on the sides and at the top of the head was longer. So tighter on the side and on the back 
like a um, fade. And uh, I really like that. And that's kind of where I am now. And that worked for a while. And then I just thought, don't fight it. Work with it. It is what it is. And the more I did the fade and then the little bit of length on the top, the longer it would get, the more it would look like I was losing my hair. So then I went a little tighter on the top and tighter and tighter. I am not bald as I sit here before the mic, but I do have hair still, but it is pretty short. And I like it. I like it because I made peace with it because I had to make peace with it. So let's broach the subject of, wait for it, drum roll, male or female pattern baldness, also known as androgenic alopecia. So my first thought back then was, why God, why me? I had a pretty awesome existence going on there, and I liked how I looked and felt pretty good about that on most days. (laughs) And it's the patterns of baldness for men and women differ. They do. But they both have a common genetic, there it is, genetic cause, or based on family history. So again, why God, why me? Oh, no, woe is me. It is very common. From the Mayo Clinic, there are more than 3 million cases per year. Usually self-diagnosable. Yeah, yeah, it sure was. It was pretty apparent. I, of course, tried deniability for a bit. Just not having it, not having it. But it was here and here to stay. So it is chronic, and it can last for years or, or really be lifelong. So with male pattern baldness, we men. The hair loss is typically, it it occurs at the top and the front of the head. Female pattern baldness, top and the crown of the head. It starts as a widening of the center part. It leaves the uh, front hairline unaffected in women. It doesn't go there. It just starts at the part and it starts to widen. So in men, baldness is associated with the male hormone, hormones called androgens. And androgens have many functions among them being regulating hair growth. So that's what it is. There are no side effects except emotional. Guys, ladies, how do we feel about it? How have you addressed it? How have you dealt with it? There can be more serious causes, such as certain cancers and medications and thyroid conditions and anabolic steroids. If somebody takes steroids, there can be hair loss associated with that could also be the result of fungal conditions of the scalp or even nutritional disorders. I know people that are anorexic or bulimic, sometimes the the hair loss is a profound part of that. But it occurs commonly in adult men. Yippee skippy. Oh yes, it does. So back to the genetics. Men and women who have close relatives with male pattern baldness are at a higher risk. Very true. Because when the relatives are on the maternal side, particularly when the relatives are on the maternal side, yep, ding, 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 my grandpa and my mom's side also thinned as I am thinning, same places and the same ways that I am. And I did not know my mom's mom. She died from multiple sclerosis when we were kids. And my mom died from lung cancer in 1994 at the age of 56. So I don't know how her balding if any, would have developed. But Granny, my dad's mom, had female pattern baldness. Her hair thinned relatively early on. She took to wearing wigs later on, too. But I remember it was always very thin. Usually it begins at the temples and recedes to form an M shape. So the middle of the head, the hair is longer and it stays kind of jutted out on the forehead, but it tends to go back on the sides a little bit. And it will continue to recede until all or most of the hair is gone. Okay. It is inevitable. There's a component to this, and that component is acceptance. We must accept it. Now, how do I turn this negative into a positive? There's a multi-billion dollar industry, as I said, helping us try to cope with this. There are medical treatments, creams, plugs, Implants or the right haircut or hairstyle. There are many good looking, sexy men out there who have capitalized on their fine looking heads with very little or no hair on them. Who do you think looks really good 
with no hair or very little hair, and those who have managed the loss of hair really well. Who out there do you think is doing it well? Men have certainly gotten with the program. There's no more comb-overs and, well, some people do that, of course. But by and large, we have learned that sometimes less is more. Other things that we do, we buy wigs or hair pieces. Sometimes the wigs and hair pieces are really good ones, and sometimes they're not so good, and it's more evident that someone is trying to hide the fact that they have hair, little or no hair. Uh, weaves. And those are weaves or wigs that are sewn into your natural hair. So you've got to have enough hair. The advantage to a weave is it stays on given any activity that we might be doing. The disadvantage is that it must be sewn again whenever new hair growth occurs. And the sewing process can damage your natural hair. So you get a weave, but it can damage what you already have. So again, we are faced with choices, folks. What choices are we going to make? There is, of course, the famous minoxidil or Rogaine, and I have no material interest in minoxidil or Rogaine. I don't benefit from saying this financially. I have no ties to it. But it is a topical medication, and it's applied to the scalp. It slows hair loss for some men and stimulates the hair follicles to grow new hair. And you have to have patience through this process because minoxidil or Rogaine can take four months to a year to produce visible results. But... Hair loss often happens again when you stop taking the medication. My husband John was taking it for a little bit because he's thinning a little bit in the M shape, the M pattern. And I think it did help a little bit. And then he said he went off of it a little bit because it's kind of costly and you have to keep doing it. And he noticed that, you know, the hair loss was beginning again. <clears throat> There's also Propecia and Proscar, which is fenesteroid. It's an oral medication that slows hair loss, and it works by blocking the production of the male hormone responsible for hair loss. It has a higher success rate than minoxidil, but the hair loss, again, returns when you stop using it. And with finasteride, it takes three months to a year, too. Patience again. And then there's counseling. Going bald can be a big change. It can cause anxiety and low self-esteem and depression. Stress may be the trigger and the secret to much of this, because stress, quote, may cause hair loss by increasing the production levels of sex hormones in the body. And all this information that I've given you is from studies and information put out by drugabuse.gov, nih.gov, mayoclinic.org, and merck.com. Is going bald a sign of bad health? 2013, a study published in the BMJ Open, 30% research is showing men with male pattern baldness have an increased risk of developing heart disease and prostate cancer. Could baldness predict other health risks? When balding occurred in me, younger than 55, that risk in men, rather, increased, as did the likelihood of heart disease for men with both frontal and crown baldness, compared to those with full heads of hair. So why do men suffer with male pattern baldness? Because it's a genetic sensitivity to dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. The body's response to DHT might influence the risk of illnesses. Heart disease, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, obesity, prostate cell growth. Although elevated testosterone causes baldness, not everyone with high levels of testosterone will lose their hair. Most men who go bald have acquired a genetic disposition to baldness. And baldness can be passed down from either parent. That's from George Katsurellis, an MD, professor of dermatology at the University of Pennsylvania. So studies have shown, too, that by the age of 50, about half of all men will have some degree of MPB, Katsurellis said. And as we discussed, losing hair usually happens over time. The hair follicle becomes smaller and smaller in the genetically determined area. Normally, hair grows and falls out. The follicle rests and then makes a new strand. However, when the follicle shrinks, the hair becomes thinner and shorter, often becoming almost microscopic over time. If you look closely at, it, at your balding head or a balding head, you may see a smattering of short, thin hairs. The emotional implications, possibly depression, anxiety, and social phobia. Depression, low mood, lack of interest or pleasure in activities, loss of energy, and sleep deprivation. Anxiety, excessive worrying, difficulty in controlling those feelings, and feelings of heightened tension. 
and social phobia or avoidance behavior follows on from the experience of anxiety symptoms leading to social and economic suffering. And social anxiety disorder is characterized by fear of humiliation or being judged negatively in social situations, as well as the avoidance of such social or performance situations. Okay, so that's pretty heavy stuff. But let's go back to solution versus the problem. Let's keep it in perspective. When we had a full head of hair, we did or did not know how to best keep it to enhance our look. I know I didn't. Some of my hair decisions were questionable at best. Some, most often, reflected the times and the styles, though. I had to stay in in style. So I say to you out here, suffering from male pattern baldness or female pattern baldness, figure out that less is very much more. And look at the people, the men and the women who you admire and like, who have little or no hair. How are they doing it? Look at the certain men in sports and media and film, and even many men on the streets where we live. Can be a very good look. In fact, I think on all men, I think it is a good look. Some people have better shaped heads than others and etc. But I think it's a good look. It is like anything how we approach it in our minds. And then how do we take action and present ourselves in the best, most stylish way? Again, it involves acceptance, choice, patience. And if we don't do these things, then I venture to say that there is more work to be done inside us physically, emotionally, and spiritually because we should be able to handle it after the acceptance of, oh my God, I'm balding. I want to read Cicero's The Six Mistakes of Man again. He was a Roman statesman and philosopher, and he wrote this some 2,000 years ago. The Six Mistakes of Man. The delusion that personal gain is made by crushing others. The tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected. Insisting that a thing is impossible because we cannot accomplish it. Refusing to set aside trivial preferences. Neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and studying. And attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. So, we're losing our hair. Let's embrace it. I'll be back with segment four shortly. Life and Happiness Podcast here in the GSMC Podcast Network. Thanks for being with me. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the fourth segment here on the Life and Happiness Podcast, sponsored by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am Jeffrey Nolt. First segment was about proofs back in geometry. Second segment was about the songs of birds. Third segment I did was on male pattern and female pattern baldness. And now this fourth segment is kind of my fun time. This fourth segment is just me. And I'm going to start with, we're going to get to You Know Who You Are and Jeff's Daily Happy List, of course. They're staples now. But I want to do a little bit about life is. Life is about taking risks if you're a cat. The other day I witnessed a really incredible short kind of moment. I was sitting at the desk doing some research for said podcast. I noticed the cat come to the top of the stairs. And the cat got to the top and saw the one Springer Spaniel on the corner of the bed catty corner to where the cat was coming from. And the cat all of a sudden did this beautifully choreographed and slow reach out with its right leg. The dog's chin was on the bed. Then after the right foot 
accomplished its goal, the left leg reached forward and the cat advanced forward. And then the cat did the same beautifully slow motion with the right leg again, advancing a little bit more across the room. And the cat, as it was advancing that right leg the second time, did this beautiful turn of the head, this slow turn of the head to check on the whereabouts of the dog. The dog's back had raised a little bit. The chin was now off the bed, looking more intently at the cat. The cat took another step, ever so slowly, trying not to irk the dog and to generate a response from the dog, meaning the dog jumps down and gets in the cat's face, which is exactly what happened. The dog jumped down, pinned the the cat up against the uh, railing and proceeded to just bark and have a fit. So the cat didn't make its goal, but it was a really beautiful moment. Hope you enjoyed that. Second thing, life is sometimes about the dog's anal glands being smelly. Now, this is not the dog that just played the cat and mouse game with the, with the cat. This is the other Springer Spaniel, JJ. Very smelly anal glands. I'm thinking, okay, what's up? And he has been, in all fairness, doing that rub his bottom across the floor or the grassy field or whatever, trying to express his anal glands to no avail, apparently, because they're very smelly. Well, I did some research on on Google, and it said a vet, of course, could express the anal glands and release them, Person, who, the dog groomer, or you could even do it yourself if you know what you're doing. Or nobody should do any expressing of anal glands because they really shouldn't need to be expressed. Okay, so I thought I'm going to give it another day or two based on that information I I got online. Actually, the very next day, I didn't smell anything. It seemed all better. It probably was expressed. They were expressed when he defecated or something. But all seems to be much better, (laughs) smell-wise. The other day, I was working at Harris Teeter, and I noticed these two gentlemen buying tomatoes. And this one had a package of tomatoes, and, um, and he went over to the other one. They were speaking a different language. The one was showing the other one a bigger package of the same tomatoes, and it was probably a better deal. I approached and said, do you guys have any questions? And um, the one in English started to say, no, no, we're good. And then I said, oh, I noticed um, you're speaking a different language. Where are you guys from? And he said, Tajikistan. I said, Tajikistan? I don't know that I know that stan. I know Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan. But I hadn't heard of Tajikistan. Well, it turns right. It's right in the middle of all the stands. It is uh, east of Uzbekistan. It is directly north of Afghanistan. And it was. it is southwest of Kyrgyzstan. So I proceeded to have a nice chat with him. And the one thing he said to me, which was really profound, was life is really good here. You have everything here that you need. And yet you don't know each other relatives, neighbors, friends, acquaintances, you really don't know each other. And I didn't take offense to that because I think to some degree he's right. We don't always invest in people, certainly not sometimes even in our own family members and families. I thought it was an interesting statement. Now, he also went on to explain that in his country, families and friends are very intertwined. They really know a lot about each other. They take care of their elderly. They don't put them in homes. They, they, they live in-house with the families, and a lot of countries do that. But he really said that the people really invest in each other. They really are involved. For example, if, there's a, if they all live in an apartment building and there's a, there's a death, that everyone in the building really showers the family of the deceased with food and company and and presence. Presence meaning their physical presence. Sounds interesting. It really, really sort of made me want to jump on a plane and head to Tajikistan and check it out. The mountains are incredible, he said, as is the food is is interesting and and spicy and, and, and good. But he really mentioned the people. And then I went online, and I noticed, too, that people that have been there really commented on the Tajikistani's um, generosity and hospitality to the 
man from Tajikistan, it was nice meeting you, and, and it sounds like a place to visit. So thank you. I hope your life here is a good one. Uh, that brings me to you know who you are. I have a co-worker at Harris Teeter, and I give him a ride home when I work with him. He doesn't live too far, and generally he walks to work, and I give him a ride home, or whoever closes with him. We are closers. And he, every time, he either he gets me a little gift from the store, like a cherry pie, or an apple pie, or blueberry muffins, or or popcorn, or a candy bars, or ice cream, my favorite ice cream, the strawberry ice cream that I've talked about before. He even got me a gallon, half gallon of that one night. He's just very grateful, and um, I appreciate the statements of, of kindness and the acts of kindness. And I've said, oh, please don't do it. It's, it's no problem. I don't mind giving you a ride home. It's right there. But he does it anyway, and now I just say thank you, and actually sometimes I buy him a little goodie or two because uh, kindness breeds kindness and acts of kindness are infectious. So it's a good good type of infection, especially these days. So to this gentleman, you know who you are. Another case, people who walk by or pretend not to notice produce that has fallen off the wet rack onto the floor. The other day I was stocking organic tomatoes and I looked across the floor and of the produce department and I saw this mound of something that had fallen off the wet rack. It might have been cilantro or something. I noticed that there were people coming down the aisle, and some people, I don't think, legitimately see it. I think some people pretend not to see it and just think that, well, it, there it is. And sometimes people actually roll right through it, and then they track more, in this case, cilantro across the floor. It's not a big deal, but I just think, hmm, I have yet to see anybody pick something up and put it back where it, from where it has fallen. But that's okay. So to those people who roll by it or act like it's not there, you know who you are. To the people that would pick it up and put it back where it came from, you know who you are as well. Jeff's Daily Happy List. I am happy that I am in very good health. I don't take it for granted. I don't think I always truly appreciate it because it's just how I feel generally. I feel really good almost every day. But I am in very good health and I'm grateful for that and it makes me happy. That I have a beautiful wedding ring on my ring finger. I look at it and gaze at it frequently. It sparkles. It's got a couple diamonds in it. And I really appreciate the vows and my commitment to John and the gift of that ring to me when he proposed. And I don't take it lightly and it does make me really happy and it just sparkles nicely. I think sparkle's a good thing. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. Sparkle a little bit. won't kill you. Uh, the other morning was a very pretty morning. It was a little warmer than it's been. And I was headed to the ER for a situation on my elbow. And I'm going to the ER because of insurance stipulations. I'd rather not take up the energy and space in an ER. It should be for people that are need emergency care. Uh, this is It needs care, but... It's not blazing emergency. Turns out I need to see a dermatologist, and the problem was not solved yet. But this was just a beautiful morning, and it was I was looking across the inner harbor at the skyline of Baltimore. And even though the city is littered with litter, it was just a beautiful, calm, and serene moment. I really appreciated it. The Queen of England makes me happy. She's, I think, a remarkable woman. When we were in London last couple of years ago, I, we went to the um, one of the gates at Buckingham Palace, and I like to talk to people and see if they'll talk back with me and give me any information. But I said, how is the queen? And this one guard said, she is just a remarkable woman. He didn't say anything else. I did happen to say, who's the pill in the family? Who's the one that's kind of nasty? Is there one? Prince Andrew. Just between you and me. That's what he said. Anyway, the queen. She's just, what, turned 95 today. I guess it's ahead in England, so she's already 95. But she's 95. Her service, her consistency, her strength, her sense of humor, and her longevity just is incredible. It really is. I am very sorry for her big loss. Seventy-some years she was with her husband. That's just, that's unprecedented for most people on this planet. 
That's quite a track record. The ups and the downs and all the things they shared and witnessed and hard times, great times, good times, sad times. That is a legacy. And I really feel for her loss. The final thing for this Daily Happy List is the flavor of a banana. Kind of the texture, too, uh, of, a, of a perfectly ripe banana. I'm not talking when there's brown spots and it's kind of gushy, but that beautiful yellow, and you peel back that skin, and that banana is just a beautiful thing. And it tastes so good, and you get your potassium, and, and life is pretty happy when you can eat a really good banana. And I would like to end again with Cicero's Six Mistakes of Man. I just, I can't get over how profound this is, really. Cicero, as I said in the other three sequences, this, the segments, was a Roman statesman and philosopher, and he wrote this 2,000 years ago. Well, it shows incredible wisdom, and it really applies to our state of affairs. So here goes. Cicero's The Six Mistakes of Man. First, the delusion that personal gain is made by crushing others. That really is how some people think and how some businesses act and how people act, is I will get ahead by crushing you. Lovely. The tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected, right? We get out of our lanes as humans and we worry about other things that we have no control over or that cannot be corrected or changed. We know it doesn't work, and yet we do it all the time. Insisting that anything is impossible because we cannot accomplish it. So we couldn't do the great assumption that, oh my goodness, it's impossible because we can't accomplish it. Well, I think if you put positive energy and brain power and work and focus into anything, I think you can accomplish anything. But we do, as humans, sometimes go to the negative and not the positive, and it's impossible. It's just impossible. Well, it's really not. Refusing to set aside trivial preferences. Yes, we do accentuate the trivial sometimes. Sometimes it's overly emotional. Sometimes it's the acquisition of things. Could be just a lot of different things. It would be trivial and not really focused on the betterment of our condition and our humanity and our species. Neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and studying. Everybody wants quick fame and quick money, but sometimes the habit of reading and studying cannot be emphasized enough. And to me, reading and studying means slowing down, listening, and taking in what others have written, and studying. Studying implies time spent. Studying means perhaps repetition of reading or listening. And finally, attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. Wow. As I've said every time when I've read these, wow. How many times do we want others to believe exactly as we do to make ourselves feel better, to make ourselves feel smarter and more advanced? Right? Really compelling, the six mistakes of man. Take them with you at the end of this podcast and really consider how you can help redirect or not make those same mistakes in your life. If we all collectively didn't make those mistakes, the world would be a better place. Clearly. Please do me a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And for goodness sake, write a review. would love to hear from you. Love the feedback, actually. I really do. Uh, Please like us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And until we meet again, make some happy moments. And as my mom used to say, I say to you, bless your hearts. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Life and Happiness Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find the show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from sex and relationships to health 
health and wellness, life and happiness, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Life and Happiness Podcast.